With Elden Ring being an open world game, it really doesn't limit us the player with what we are able to do. Elden Ring lets us go around the world at our leisure, grabbing many different items, weapons, and different spells. This results in a very similar playthrough or playstyle that gets repeated in a lot of our hitless runs that we perform. This got me thinking though, what if we turned Elden Ring into a linear styled game? And this is where region lock comes into play. The rules of region locked are quite simple. I can't leave any area until I defeat the rune bearer of said area. This means I can't leave the starting area Limgrave until we take down Godric the Grafted. This will continue when we enter into Liurnia, where we will be forced to stay until we take down the Runebearer Renala. This creates a much more unique experience to Elden Ring that limits you to use certain builds or strategies that you wouldn't normally need to deploy. I would highly recommend you guys to try this challenge out, even if it's just a regular playthrough of the game. It's a very fun experience. All right, let's go and start. But without further ado, let's get this region locked hitless run underway. We start a run as the Samurai, as it starts with the Uchi Katana and a bow that will serve us well in our hitless journey. We also choose the Cracked Pots as our starting gift. As we set out, we rush to Margit at the very beginning of the run with our unupgraded gear. The reason I take out Margit immediately is for the runes he will drop for us. We're going to need some runes to purchase some items from vendors in the beginning parts of our journey. Normally, we would go to Liurnia and get the bell bearings, so the Twin Maiden Husk back at the round table would sell us weapon upgrade materials. But since this is region locked, we won't have that luxury. Instead, after Margit, we head off to gather some materials in Limgrave. First thing we grab is the Strength Knot tier hanging out on this ledge, and continuing to this night riding a horse. After taking him out, he rewards us with Golden Vow, which will grant us a damage buff of 10%. We then jump down the cliffside to this camp below, which has a very good pickup for us, this Exalted Flesh. The Exalted Flesh grants a bonus damage buff of 20%. We continue down the road past the camp to an NPC, Alexander, who is stuck in the ground. We free him and he gives us yet another Exalted Flesh. Sadly, we do have to engage Alexander for the talisman he drops on his defeat, which is the Warrior Jar Shard. This will grant us a 10% damage increase to our weapon skills, such as the Mighty Shot on our bow or Unsheath on the Uchi Katana. A tiny bit further down the road from Alexander is a merchant who will sell us three Smithing Stone ones, as well as a few extra arrows. From here, we head off towards the Third Church of Marka to pick up our physique, but first we stop at this graveyard to pick up some runes, as well as the Fevor's Cookbook, which will grant us the ability to craft sleeping pots. We arrive at the church to grab our physique and then head off towards the woods. First off, we pick up the Spiked Crack tier, which will increase our damage when we do fully charged attacks. Then we head to Mistwood Runes, where we will loot a chest holding a Smithing Stone too, as well as another chest that gives us the Axe Talisman, which will also increase our charged heavy attack damage. Ugh. Continuing past the runes, we reach another merchant, offering us more things we will want to pick up. This time, we have a Smithing Stone 1, as well as some Trina Lilies, as well as some Sleep Arrows. We grab a side of Grace at Fort Height for later, and head out to purchase some base items from Kale. A few throwing knives, the crafting kit, three crack pots, as well as the missionary's cookbook, which will allow us to craft holy pots. After talking with Kale, we head south to the Weeping Peninsula. On the way, we pick up a few more Smithing Stones on this bridge, as well as this Smithing Stone 2 amongst these enemies. We arrive at yet another merchant selling us some more items. We pick up a few kukris as well as another smithing stone too, and yet another crackpot. We have gathered all the things we need to enter Stormvale and challenge Godric to be able to leave Limgrave. So we head back to the round table to get ready. We buy a dagger so we can put Golden Vow on it and sell all of our equipment that we don't need. Then we level our Uji Katana to plus four and head into Stormvale. We level our flasks, attune our physique with our tears, level up our decks to 22, and run the castle. We firstly take out Gostok, as he will lock us in a room if we leave him be. We continue along the path outside the castle, grabbing the Smithing Stone 2 before taking on some enemies with our bow, granting us a safe entry to the castle. Brother! In the castle, we make sure to pick up this bundle of sleep arrows and perform a backstab wake up unsheath into an R1 to deal with the knight guarding the key in the dark room. We get the key and head through the rest of the castle until we reach our Sight of Grace in the Rampart Tower. 
Stormvale is a really well-designed area in Elden Ring, and one of the cool aspects of this run that we're doing is that we get to explore a lot of it more than what we would regularly see in a normal Hitless run. I'll be honest, a lot of these pickups I didn't even know existed before doing this run, so it was a really cool experience to learn more of the castle's layout. We pick up these Smithing Stone 2s hidden well in this back corner, and then we drop down from the Sight of Grace and take a path through the castle that will lead us to Godric's Great Rune location. We also pick up this Golden Foot on the way, which I will use after defeating Godric. We reach the Sight of Grace and light it for later before returning to Rampire Tower to continue through the castle. We reach yet another Sight of Grace than Castle Delight so we can safely warp back to it after dropping down outside of this room to snag yet another Smithing Stone too. We grab the Sight of Grace outside the Godric Arena for later, do a little more navigation of the castle for some more Spinning Stone 2s. We then use a Sleep Pod to sleep this troll, as we want to loot items in front of its line of sight. If the troll were to aggro to us, it would force us to engage it as I wouldn't be able to teleport away. The item we really want to pick up is another Smithing Stone 2. We then return to the round table to sell all of our unused gear, and we level our Uchi to a plus 6. We return to Stormvale Castle to take out an NPC who holds the weapon we will be using later in the run, and this weapon is the Stormhawk Axe, held by Nefali Lu. We sleep the troll once more and head down to the room that Nefali is located in. We do a specific combo to max out her damage before she'll aggro to us, and then finish her off with an unsheath. The axe is levelable with somber stones, which we will get 1 through 4 once we reach the lake with Iji. But for now, we're gonna take on Godric with our Uchi Katana that we just leveled up. God damn, Shags, thank you for five gifted subs. A beautiful man and or woman or anything else in between is gonna be coming into your life very soon to give you the best night of your life because you get five subs. That's what happens when you get five subs. You get to have sex with strangers. Pretty cool. If anyone can get to suffer sex, take a second to say thank you. That's very kind, Shags. Thank you so much. God damn. Focus? Imagine needing to focus for fucking idiot Godric. What a potato boss this guy is. Look at him. What a silly goose. The absolute silliest of geese. Incoming hit. If I get hit to Godric, I will like literally fold my Twitch channel. Easiest Twitch folding channel of my life. I have the kindest chat. I have the kindest and most absurd chat I've ever seen on Twitch. That much I can say for sure. Osor, what's up, dude? Nice. I'm not absurd, Mew. You've done some pretty absurd stuff in this chat room. Let's be real. I've seen Mew be a little silly. Hey, Toastface. Good to see you, man. What's new with you? Here we go. Unsheath times four R one. Two unsheaths will stagger. Second R one will bleed. Ajiji. homie live? A homie did live. I've never seen him live there. After taking down Godric, we are able to access a new part of the map, Liernia. Exploring Liernia is beneficial, as it will allow us to gain more items to further strengthen our character's damage. The first thing we do is craft some holy pots to quickly take down the Deathrite bird in the lake, which rewards us upon its defeat with the Red Feathered Branch Sword, which is a talisman that grants us a 20% damage boost when our HP is low. 
We also grab a Grace at Scenic Isle for later before picking up the Dexterity Not tier and grabbing the Boil Prawn Shack of Grace on the way. From here, we head north and take a teleporter in the lake that leads to Blacksmith Iggy. Iggy will sell us Somberstones 1 through 4, which will let us upgrade our axe we got back from Nefeli. Leaving Iggy, we pick up some runes and balloons in the lake before grabbing the Academy Glintstone key, which grants us access to the Academy housing Renala. After picking up this key, we also snag the Jellyfish Shield. The Jellyfish Shield gives us a boost of 20% damage when equipped and the Ash of War is active. We are going to use this shield for a specific strat a bit later on in the run. While heading to the Academy, I pick up a free Somberstone 3 located on this chair in the lake, as it saves us quite a few runes instead of having to buy it from Iggy. We grab the Academy Side of Grace, and we do a few more chores we neglected to do at the start of the run. Since we have become a little bit stronger since the beginning of the run, we take this time to return to Limgrave to kill the knight in Fort Height to give us the Ash of War Bloody Slash. The Ash of War Bloody Slash we are going to use to cause damage to ourselves to take advantage of the Red Feathered Branch Sword we received from the Deathbird back in Liernia. We also take this time to run and grab the now accessible Godric's Great Room, which will boost all of our character's levels by 5 while active. After grabbing our Great Rune, we return to the round table to sell all of our unwanted gear and equip Bloody Slash on a weapon. We also level our axe to a plus four, but we aren't going to use it just yet. But for now, with all of our chores taken care of, we return back to the academy. We level up our strength by two points so that we're able to wield the Stormhawk axe in the future and put the rest into dexterity so we'll get more damage from our Uchi Katana. I also forget to pick up a spell on a scarab in Liernia called Blood Flame Blade, so I quickly return to Liernia to pick it up and equip it. Heading into the academy, the entry is guarded by two mages with lots of scary ranged sorcery attacks. We're going to abuse their AI to investigate a noise caused by a kukri we throw, then approach with stealth and use our axe's weapon art to easily take them down, which is why I wanted the two points of strength to wield the axe early. Now, this running section is one of the worst running sections in the entire game. Normally, if there is a hitless run that someone is doing that has them going through the academy, at this point they would have the Ash of War Assassin's Gambit. Assassin's Gambit causes your player to have no noise while running, and it also makes it harder for enemies to see you from a distance, which trivializes a lot of running sections in Elden Ring. However, again, since this is region locked, we don't have that luxury. And I would say about 50% of my runs overall during my attempts of getting this run ended at this running section. Had it been from an arrow in the back, or from a dog that followed me too far, or a zombie hiding in the bush, I had lost hitless runs every way you could imagine at this point of the run. It had gotten so bad that I had actually taken the liberty at the start of this stream to learn a brand new strategy in the area, which takes out all of the RNG of the running section. Instead of running for it on this bridge and hoping for the best to not get hit with an arrow in the back, we're instead going to take out all of the enemies in the area. Near the end of the bridge, we're going to drop down to the left and wait for all of the enemies that are aggroed to us to either de-aggro or jump off the bridge down after us. With the safety of this fall in between us, we can wait until all the zombies fall down and try and make it out across this gap after us. Sadly, their AI doesn't allow them to jump across, so we can just wait until they attack, safely jump across, and dispose of them. From here, we're going to abuse the AI of the archers in this cave with a kukri, sneak up behind them, and use the weapon art of our axe to take care of them. There's also one dog hiding below us in a bush, so we crafted the firebomb earlier, which I'm going to throw at to take care of the dog. Now with all of the enemies taken care of, it's just a simple running section with a couple dogs at the end, which we can finesse past and jump onto the elevator to safety. Remember when I said that this running section was the worst part of the run and we lost about 50% of every single attempt that made it this far? Well, there's a little bit of a caveat to that. The boss after this running section, the Red Wolf of Radagon, is also a part of the run where I would say I would lose about 50% of every attempt going into him. It's not that he's a very difficult boss, it's more of the arena where we fight him. The arena is very small, very, very claustrophobic, 
and the situation that can happen with Red Wolf is he can cast his three magic dart attacks and combine that with a dash at the player. Since you have to roll the wolf's dash attack, you're kind of in a position where after recovering from the roll, you're not really able to do anything about the magic missiles coming after you. And this causes somewhat of an impossible situation and a not very good situation for our hitless run. Because of this, a lot of runs tend to die at this boss, so anytime we're able to get past it, it is definitely a run we want to take seriously. Cack a W, dude. With Red Wolf taken care of, we return for one final chore back in Limgrave at Murkwater Cave. We return to turn Patches into a merchant back on Scenic Isle, so he will sell us a very important item for the Renala kill. And this item is the Fan Daggers. We grab the Fan Daggers from Patches and return to the Academy. I need exactly eight Fan Daggers, chat. Not any more, not any less. Heading near Renala's room, we have to utilize some stealth to sneak past the knight guarding the elevator. I aggroed this guy last time and lost the run, so I'm gonna focus here and not be a silly billy. For Renala, we're gonna utilize a range in phase one to take care of the children protecting Renala using our bow. Once Renala falls to the ground, we're gonna deal enough damage to make it very close before going into phase two. The reason we wait is so we'll have ample time to cast our buffs before the cutscene takes place before phase two. Before we deal the final blow to Renala, we cast all of our buffs for the start of phase two, where we will run up and throw our fan daggers at her at point blank range, ensuring that they all hit her. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eights for just in case. GG. With Renala defeated, we are able to finally leave Liernia and head towards Alta's Plateau via the ruin strewn precipice. It's really cool taking this route through Elden Ring in a hitless run, as this is the first time I've done so. This one I had to spend a lot of time coming up with strats to get through the area safely, and that was a lot of fun. A really refreshing experience. A lot of this section comes down to utilizing sleep pots and sleep arrows to various bats in the area. You have to shoot this bat first, otherwise he will chase you for some reason. However, all the other bats don't give a fuck. Only he gives a fuck. So you have to shoot him first. Doesn't make any sense, I know. At the top, we are met with the boss of the area, Makar. Makar is a very interesting fight, and using our new weapon, the Stormhawk Axe, we're gonna perform a scripted kill on the boss. I wanted to give a quick shout out to Nuclear Pasta Tom, another no hit runner you guys should definitely check out. He's the one that came up with this really cool kill on this boss that we're gonna perform. Before heading into the fight, we use all of our runes and level strength as much as possible, as our axe scales a bit better with it. The strat we are going to use is quite simple. We're going to get to the point of the arena right before Makar's AI activates and then cast all of our buffs. Once buffed, we're going to roll forward once, initiating the fight, and immediately jump three times. Then we're going to throw a sleep pot and retreat back to the door. The reason we jump three times is we're using it as a precise way to time our sleep pot throw on Makar. One, two, three, throw a sleep pot. Makar is scripted to do the same rushing attack towards the player upon his AI's activation, which you will get slept in the middle of before coming to a stop near us at the door. While enemies in Elden Ring are affected by sleep, the amount of poise damage they take is increased. We take advantage of this by doing two fully charged heavy attacks followed by a jumping heavy attack to stagger. Once staggered, we simply use the axe's weapon art on a staggered Makar as we easily take him down. Such a cool strat, and again, a huge thanks to Tom for finding it. Once we exit the precipice, we enter into Alta's Plateau, where we immediately head towards Draconic Tree Sentinel to gain entry into Lendell. On the way to DTS, we pick up this somber five on a cliffside on this chair. Upon reaching DTS, we are going to abuse its AI and lure it to the cliff's edge. Once here, we are going to sneak up behind it and stagger it with an Uchi combo. Once staggered, we're simply going to attack it and it's going to fall off the cliff for the easy kill. Uh, cool strat here that the kids can do at home. Once we get into Lendell, we are able to progress through normally up until we detour to pick up this somber six near the dragon's wing leading to Goldfree. We take the Sight of Grace to return to the round table to level up our axe to plus six and then return to Lendell to take on Goldfree's shade. Thank you guys. <clears throat> In hindsight, I probably should have went and got some fucking daggers. 
Is the bot broken? It is. I'm gonna fix the bot tonight. And I'm gonna make it tomorrow. The barbrate, he did. Barb sent the, the good folk over. Song request Saturday tomorrow. Because the bot is broken. I'll put it on tomorrow. It's taking over again. I have four daggers. That's not bad. After the shade fight, we proceed up the tree branch and head straight into the Margot fight. You might need to be careful. Dr. Buckethead, welcome in, man. Pig's a monster now? What changed? Two in a row? That's so weird. You made her power really strong? I'll have to check it out. Is that Junior? What's up, bro? How we doing, man? Gotta love him, iFlames. Great dude. It's good, Chet. How are you doing, ma'am? Yeah, the run's really good, ma'am. Still hitless. Doc, holy shit, man. What's new with you, bro? How's life? It's been a while. Good to have you back. Hi, Carlo. What's up, man? Goddamn, finally, Jazzy. I'm doing great, Carlo. You're not bad, Shat. That's what we like to hear, man. Hell yeah, guys.
After Morgoth's defeat, the run starts to kind of turn into a normal hitless route, as the rest of the game is pretty linear in its own aspect. There's nothing really else we can pick up to make our time getting the run any easier. We do receive Rold's Medallion, which will grant us access into the mountaintops and the Fire Giant. Getting to the elevator without our usual Strat with Assassin's Gambit is pretty sketchy, so we have to take a very specific line during the nighttime with stealth to ensure no enemies follow us to the elevator. Ah! It's okay. Surely. Uh, he can get on the, uh, the elevator and kill us here, though. Well, you know. He lives there now. We also need to be extra careful with the mobs at the top of the elevator as we can't sneak past them either. We're going to throw a sleep pot to the mobs at the top, allowing us to safely run by. After taking the elevator down, we traverse the mountains on horseback, skipping all of the enemies as we ride on past. Before the gargoyle at the lift of rolled, we loot a somber stone seven in this skull. After taking the rolled lift, we continue forward throughout the mountaintops. Since we don't have Assassin's Gambit, we have to employ a strategy with Kukri's to lure this enemy away from the bridge that we have to pass. This mob has a fireball range attack that he can shoot at us as we ride on by, so it's very nice to ensure that he doesn't do that. We then pass the bridge safely and grab a somber smithing stone eight on this scarab. We arrive outside of the Fire Giant and return to the round table to level our axe to plus eight, and then return to the mountaintops to take on the Fire Giant. Here we go. Fire Giant can be a pretty scary boss fight. However, we are going to use a script to ensure that we take him down without fail. What we're going to do is we're going to break his ankle with a charged heavy attack, and then during the animation of his ankle breaking, we're going to continue dealing poise damage with more charged heavy attacks until he fully staggers. During his stagger animation, we're then going to throw two sleep pots to further stagger him. During this time, we do more charged heavy attacks to push phase two. I actually missed quite a bit of damage on this kill, and we had to deal with a couple of extra attacks before phase two takes place. We do eventually deal enough damage, and we get to phase two without a hit. At the start of phase two, we attack his hand to deal more poise damage, and then throw a kukri to keep stagger up. As long as we are in front of the fire giant when he does his volcano AoE attack, it is safe to run up to this spot on his leg to complete the stagger. Then we simply weapon art his eye for more damage with our axe to take him down. After fire giant, we are taken to farm Azul, which we easily run through as farm Azul is pretty simple. At the end of farm Azul, we pick up the Somberstone 9 for our axe before we take on the Godskin duo. The duo itself is pretty simple, as we are going to use sleep pots to sleep both godskins before taking them out with fully buffed charged attacks. Alright, GG. Yo, Wang, what's up, man? Thanks for the good luck, bro. How you doing? Yeah, I'm great, Wang. Trying to get this shit done today, man. Hey, Geo, welcome. After a 
fairly easy encounter with the Gonskins. We finished traversing the rest of Fire Azul. We have to take down all of the flying birds along the path to Malekith. The birds struggle with dealing with elevation, so we wait for them to do their climbing animation before we safely attack them. On the way, we pick up our final axe upgrade, giving us the full plus 10. We eventually reach the site of grace at the end of Farm Azul, and then quickly return to the round table to level our axe before returning back to Farm Azul for our encounter with Malekith. Plus 10. Any foul tarnish, dude? After taking out Malekith, we are warped to the Ashen Capital. Gideon can be a very scary fight for some hitless runs, but luckily for us, we can perform a scripted kill to easily take him down. The script is two fully charged heavy attacks into a weapon art for the simple kill. Oh wait, just weapon art here. Never mind. We level up our strength and dex as much as we can for some more damage, and then we head into the Horalu boss fight.
wasn't expecting that. Lining them up like ass crack. Watch me as I grab it, take. <laughs> With all of the bosses now defeated, the only thing left to do for our run is challenge the final fight, Rata Beast. Don't fuck it up. I got the reference. Jump attack, charge dart two. Unlock, spin around, charge dart two. Let's fucking go! No hit! Region locked! Elden Ring! It's done. Dude. Dude, what the fuck was that bitch avoiding my charged R2 attack into Elden Stars? I was like, bruh. Did you guys see that shit? I was like, bro. No shot, man. <laughs> No shot, he just dodged that shit into Elden Stars. There's no shot. Region Locked Hitless was a really fun run that made me learn and play the game in a very new and fun way from what we would normally do in our Hitless runs. If you made it to the end of this video, consider subscribing, as I do a lot of similar content like this. Thanks for watching the video, guys, and as always, have a good day. Hell yeah.